how random ideas will come to us at the most interesting places? I was perched at the top of this 100-foot tall pine tree, which itself was perched at the top of this mountain in western Montana, minding my own business, when I had this realization of a new answer to an age-old question. Is nature this holistic place, uh, or is it an individualistic place? Is it full of interdependence, or is it full of selfish, acting species that are just out for themselves? A hundred years ago, a scientist named Frederick Clemens came out to describe this whole, uh, nature as a holistic place. And he published a paper, and the next year, another scientist published the contrary opinion, and for the next hundred years, that selfish paradigm, uh, the second one, uh, dominated, because we, we just couldn't see how nature would be this holistic place where things are working together and nurturing each other. Many of you will have seen this image, either in a movie or in the photograph or other places, and you can, uh, it's, a, it's a photo of uh, a, a bunch of male penguins that are huddled together because it's about minus 80 degrees and they're keeping warm. They're each carrying a little egg that's gonna, be, that's gonna hatch uh, later at the end of this, this winter period. What we don't usually think of when we see this photo is that they're all carrying this little egg that's gonna hatch, that those children are gonna become each other's worst competitors. They're all gonna be fighting for the same food and they're all gonna be uh, hiding from the same predators, finding places to hide. So what is nature? Is it this huddling, warm, keeping each other warm place? Or is it this place that every, everything is out for themselves? We've known for a long time, of course, that there are many examples, particularly among social species, of, of nurturing together, of working together. Bees, ants, and of course, humans. Another example, very common, of, of nurturing, we call them mutualisms, is things like bees and flowers. They, they work together. But, those examples are not particularly surprising because the needs of bees and flowers are so different that they're not in conflict. The bees don't need to find good soil to, to grow in. So the rub, here's the rub, is competition must occur. Resources are finite. We see all throughout nature that there are adaptations for, for ways to fight it out. And you know, in this plant pot, uh, the uh, the plants are going to be, uh, they can't both survive forever. One of them is going to win out. So the question is, are, um, what if the resources that these species are needing are not happening at the same time? So we return to the penguins for a second. At that moment, they're dealing with an issue of cold. It's too cold for them. And that's not happening at the same time as the issue that's going to happen later on of not enough food. Uh, and so the, I want to explore for the rest of the talk about not just social species, but all species in nature. What are they doing? It turns out that uh, high elevation plants all over the world huddle together just like the penguins do to keep warm. In this slide here of a place that I like to go skiing in British Columbia, I, I get to do my work on the side as I'm going down these slopes. The, the trees that we see at the top the highest trees we see, they're always clustered in groups of the little islands. And they're doing the same thing that the penguins are doing. They're huddling together because it's so cold up there. And they are, it allows them to survive higher up on the mountain than anyone else growing on its, by itself. The same thing happens not just in two cold situations, but two dry situations. The, some plants are able to uh, grow in a place that's very dry, like a semi-arid desert, like these ones we see here. But what they're doing is they're creating a bit of shade on the ground beneath them, which is going to be a bit cooler, a bit more moist, and a whole bunch of other species can then live in this environment thanks to those other species that got there first. If we look outside the window right here, we'll see something very similar happening, the sand dunes. A whole bunch of species cannot live in this place because there's too little soil, but a few can. They move in, stabilize the situation, and other species can then move in on top of those, and so uh, the biodiversity goes up because of the nurturing that's happening from a, an earlier species. I call these Goldilocks problems. So like Goldilocks who had uh, tried the porridge and it was too hot, the next one was too cold, these are issues that all species, or many species will have to uh, address before they can get to the core of just living, surviving, and and getting, finding food. Are these examples 
that I'm showing here, are these just idiosyncratic, rare anecdotes? How common is this nurturing in nature? Well, there's another type of nurturing that happens. Every tree on the entire planet creates a, a sh shade and a slightly cooler place beneath it. So on the right, where there are no trees, it's hotter, drier place. And on the left, all these, these trees are making it cooler and more moist. And of course, these trees are making habitat for animals. We know that, that's, that's important. But they're also making habitat for uh, the, their competitors, the closest uh, species that need the same thing. Trees are helping trees, trees are helping plants. Um, and so, uh, right, and this type of uh, po positive, the changes that these species, the trees are doing, occurs in many other types of ecosystems around the world. Corals are building structures that then other species can then build on top of or use the nooks and crannies that are in there. And some of the time it's uh, species that are very different, like fish are different than corals, but other time it's the species like the penguins that are their closest competitors that are simultaneously building and nurturing each other. Same thing happens with mangroves. This group of examples, so we had the Goldilocks problems, this is the builders. All species that, that grow and uh, like trees and corals with structures, they create scaffolding. They create a, a place that's new and that did not exist before. Uh, taking a parking lot and getting stuff to grow on it makes it into a much more diverse place. So these two types of species, these are very widespread everywhere we look. They're changing the playing field of nature, C increases biodiversity, I want to point out that there's an interesting uh, con uh, conflict here in what's going on. They're all being very selfish. They're trying to survive themselves, and they're doing what they know how to do. And yet, at the same time, they're also helping out others and nurturing this whole place to become a biodiverse, rich place. So they're selfish and altruistic. We call this, uh, in the philosophy of science, it's called weak altruism, which is something where both the giver and the receiver are benefiting, but it's nevertheless a nurturing. There's a third type of nurturing I want to talk about, and it is, uh, I'll, I'll walk through the example. If we have two trees planted together, they're going to start competing with each other for light, for nutrients, and space. As they grow bigger, usually one of them, if they're growing too close together, will, will die, and they're enemies. If you put more than two trees together, the situation changes a little bit because the first and the third one in this diagram are both competing mutually with the second one. And so you get this phenomenon that the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend situation. <laughs> and until recently, when we started getting more powerful computers and doing interesting computer modeling, we didn't know what the net result of all that is. Can you tell me if you have a huge forest of millions of trees, is it mostly friends helping each other or mostly enemies hurting each other? And so some of the work I've been doing in, um, in the last years, few years, is showing that the net result is actually this nurturing that's going on among species that are their own competitors. So next time you go walking through a forest, you can look at all the trees and, and the plants and, and think, realize that there's this tangled web of both friend and enemy relationships going on that's extremely interesting and exciting. There's an exception to this. So I've shown uh, this enemy of my enemy of my friend. This plant, uh, probably none of you know of it because it's invading Western North America. It's called spotted knapweed. Almost everybody in the mountain states will know this plant. And it is doing something different that's preventing this enemy of my enemy of my friend thing from going on. It's using chemical weaponry. And as we all know, that probably does, it doesn't do wonders for anybody. Biodiversity goes down. What they do is they exude toxic chemicals from their roots and they kill all the other species around them. This meadow or this meadow in Montana used to be full of wildflowers of many different colors and now it's fairly homogeneous with basically this one plant uh, growing. So it's not playing fairly in, the, in this game. It's very toxic. And I, that's an important point. When you add toxicity to these, all these interactions, the, bio, the diversity does not increase, it goes down. But as a general point, for most species, since computer, other computer models are showing, and sorry, and the little boy there, he's a, uh, one of my friend's sons, and that friend has been working on this problem for a while. 
and showing that computer models show that that strategy of being toxic can't, can't take over the world. It's all, it's, it's going to, it has to be that most species are not toxic or else nothing would exist. So last point on this slide is that, again, these, these friends and enemies, this situation here, is, it's again about selfishness, yet altruistic, as long as they're playing fairly and not toxic. So three examples of types of ways that nature nurtures. At this point, I'm going to move the talk into two different, uh, two different angles. What does this say for us, for people? What do we learn about this, these ways that nature nurtures? And secondly, how can we help nature nurture herself or nurture us, as the case may be? For thousands of years, people who had things to sell realized that they should go and sell their wares next to their competitor. They would make fruit markets and they would make leather markets. They would make all sorts of markets where every, the, the net benefit of being next to your competitor outweighs the benefit of you being isolated on your own. This same thing is happening every day. This is an aerial photograph of West Missoula, Montana, where I used to live. And the Walmart and the home, sorry, the Walmart and the Target are right across the street from each other. These are the strongest competitors. Why did they choose to go there? Because they want to compete more and get each other's customers, but yet they're both doing it. So they're actually both helping each other at the same time as competing. Lowe's and Home Depot do the same thing, and this goes on over and over again. Example, a uh, quick example of where uh, the, chain, the playing field has changed. The Starbucks effect, a company, Starbucks starts up and makes us realize that the most important, the, the, that we all want to spend $5 on a cup of coffee. <laughs> and that's great for their business plan, but it also spawned the creation of hundreds, if not thousands, of small coffee shops around North America that didn't exist before. The, the effects of Starbucks are both competitive and incredibly nurturing to those around them in the same way that we see in nature. How do we, how do we take all this knowledge and move it to uh, nature and na uh, us helping nature and helping nature help herself? And I'm going to talk about two examples. We are now, as of a few weeks ago, we're now very certain that the global climate is warming and that we are responsible. This, today I'm not gonna talk, uh, discuss you know, the, the, the issues related to that, because what, what my point of my talk is, is regardless of what's what, what the causes are, it will be good if we can find ways to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and bring it into, let's say, trees. This photo of Patagonia uh, doesn't have many trees, if any trees, but it used to. They, the uh, people here and the government here uh, 50 to 70 years ago uh, tried to move people south into this Patagonia area to make ranches. And so they burnt all the trees, uh, millions of acres of trees, to open up the land for ranching. Now the ranching is less important and there's interest in moving these back to forests, what they used to be, both locally and globally because of this global climate issue. We, if we can plant more trees in places that didn't have trees, that's a particularly good way to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. There's a problem. This place is too dry for trees, little trees in particular, to, to survive. So this is a Goldilocks problem, a classic Goldilocks problem. But of course, the classic Goldilocks problem doesn't exist very long in classical literature since I'm the one who presented it. So, but I wanted to test this, uh, this place and this phenomenon as a Goldilocks problem. And so a colleague and I decided to plant little trees in groups, tight groups of, tr of uh, clusters and other ones that are isolated and far apart from each other. The last hundred years of ecology would tell us that those individuals should, those isolated individuals should survive the best, they don't compete with anybody, and these dense groups should not. That's exactly the opposite of what we found. The dense clusters helped each other survive. They nurtured each other. These were their tightest competitors. They're all looking for exactly the same thing, but they all needed to solve the same Goldilocks problem. We're now working to scale up that little experiment to commercial scales in this area, uh, and other people are working on similar problems around the world to bring uh, forests onto landscapes that didn't exist and doing it in a way that's much more successful. The last point I want to make, uh, mines around the world, when they, uh, 
do their mining, often they've had to remove vegetation. They, and in the case of the Alberta oil sands, uh, the uh, companies are obliged by law after they're finished to put the forest back. Uh, that may sound like an easy job, maybe it doesn't. It turns out it's not an easy job. The, this creates, it's a huge Goldilocks problem. There's not enough soil after the mines go away and there's, it's too toxic. The successes so far of the oil companies in returning these forests have been very low. And there are potentially many reasons and we're starting to use some of these nurturing ideas to help in some of that reclamation work. And we're, I'll get back to you in a few years to see how that's going. So back to my treetop. Is nature holistic or individualistic? Well, it's both. Hopefully you have come to that same conclusion that I did. What th this, it convincing many scientists of this is uh, a, an uphill road. But we've already, uh, th this has already changed uh, the way that we're doing things and we've had shown increasing successes in some of those examples like the recovery of the forests. And to, uh, just, just with the, the knowledge that I've uh, presented today, it's already changed the way we think about nature. Thank you very much. <laughs>